Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here at HSC Montreal, back to my roots, where I started to learn about innovation and entrepreneurship. And what's innovation if it's not reinventing the future? But my journey started a few hundred meters from here, on the top of the mountain, where I started my training as an emergency doctor. And while I'm a city guy who enjoys city life, a true Montrealer, I ended starting my practice in one of the most isolated areas of our country, up north. I mean, real north. <laughs> and while I was city disconnected, isolated, with little or no technology, and absolutely no roads, I felt I was becoming a better person. Sometimes the most austere environments can teach you a lot about yourself. And in life, there's moments that you will never forget and days that you will always remember. Where were you on January 12, 2010? In my case, that day changed my life. Because shortly after, I went from far north to far south, from minus 40 to plus 40, from no roads to broken roads, and from little to no technology to disruptive technology. And this is where I felt I belonged. Seven on Richter scale, 300,000 deaths, 300,000 injured, 1.2 million of homeless after January 12 in Haiti. On 2010, life was literally falling apart. Something had to be done. And with the help of colleagues that I met up north, we thought, we felt that we had something to do. And we were all there for this noble cause of helping with the Canadian Red Cross to the emergency response unit. And on our arrival, it was chaos. The situation was so unstable. As you can see on this map, kidnapping, hijacking, theft, vandalism, and murder were mapped daily across the city. We were in port prince and at that moment, there was a severe cholera epidemic spreading all over Haiti. But on a sunny morning, one day, we decided all together to go and establish our first field hospital of the Canadian Red Cross in Carrefour, a city that was heavily destroyed by the earthquake and was living the, one of the worst epidemics of cholera across all the country. 36 hours after our arrival, we had our first patient. Her name is Annie. She was five years old and she was severely dehydrated and at risk of death. Because as you might know, cholera is an infectious disease that can dehydrate you even if you're healthy and can kill somebody within a few hours. And as you can see her here, she's recovering with her mother in one of our tents. Three weeks after, and after many sleepless nights and over 1,000 patients treated, we were considered, with the help of my colleagues, Haitian brave doctors, as one of the best cholera treatment centers in the whole country. At the end of my mission, I was asked by the Canadian Red Cross to have a handover for my replacement. And I thought, how can I describe what we truth for the cholera response in the past weeks so we can transfer that so they can have a better response in the weeks to come? How can we transfer all the information about the patients we treated and were treating and how can we transfer all the knowledge that we gained on the community that we were serving? Everything that we had were small pieces of paper that were smelling chlorine. There must be a solution. And in my opinion, the solution was through the use of information technology. And as we say, necessity is the mother of all inventions. I made this a personal goal to bring that information technology to the hands of humanitarians. And I, when I returned back home, I searched, and I searched, and I found that we weren't the only ones who believed that information technology can have an impact after a disaster to save more lives. In fact, there were was many teams who worked 
hard to deliver such technology. But why, many years later, there was no technology in the hands of humanitarians? Because many of those projects were failing to address the principal causes, the principal elements that were failing in disaster response. Technology needed to be always ready. We know that 90% of emergency response is done by local responders. Technology can't be, br can't be brought by international emergency response, who arrives usually many days later. They need to have this technology in their hands when the disaster happens to save more lives within the first few hours. Technology also needed to be mobile because emergency response teams have to move fast. And we know that the, in the countries that to receive the most of the aid, humanitarian aid, they have the highest number of penetration of technology, mobile technology, even more than developed countries. 1.4 billion of people start to ha have their first computing experience with a smartphone. We should leverage that smartphone literacy across the world. Technology has to be network resilient too, because as we saw in Haiti, over 90% of the cell towers after the earthquake were down. Either they were destroyed or non-functional. And we need a technology that is network resilient, that can function without any other infrastructure. Technology also needs to be smart. When we arrived in Haiti for the cholera response, we didn't know much about cholera. We learned on the spot. And this real-time learning should be enhanced by the use of artificial intelligence, all this guidance that can help us to make better decisions faster. And technology must be low, low cost. So it has to be affordable by all emergency response teams and all humanitarians worldwide. Of course, it must be ethical, evidence-based, and have a social impact, even in non-disaster context. And this is what we thought that should be in the hands of humanitarian. And this was the birth of our project, Humanity 3D. What we developed is something based on the Internet of Things. Who knows what the Internet of Things means by raising hands? So our technology is based on the Internet of Things. What we have developed is the capacity of a cell phone. It's a, in fact, it's an app, a single app that can connect all smartphones and all tablets all together, even if there is no infrastructure, even if there is no cellular communications, even if there is no internet connections. And on the top of that, well, we provided some services, mapping, collaboration, communication, and we even went for flying objects, drones. So what our technology is embedded on the drones so they're able to help gather information, take pictures, recognize victims, take videos, do real-time maps, and at the same time, transfer information between teams when they are very distant. And we did this with some help of different partners. And we're having multiple partnerships being established right now, like with a Tech3 lab here at HSC Montréal, Ecole Polytechnique, Université de Montréal, and many other universities in North America. And we were funded by Grand Challenge Canada, who considered our innovation as being something that can transform the humanitarian sector. And last year, we were selected by, this, by Cisco through their grand challenge for the Internet of Things. And we were selected among 3,000 submissions coming from over 100 countries. We were semi-finalists. And this year, a few weeks ago, we came back from Dubai where we presented our technology when we were selected from over 1,000 submissions coming from over 165 countries. We had a dream to bring that information technology to the hands of humanitarians. And slowly, that dream is becoming reality. So this is the last demonstration that we did in Dubai at Drones for Good. What we were able to demonstrate, we were networking all devices all together without any need for any other 
networking infrastructure. We also connected the drones to the hum humanitarians, to the emergency response team that was there. We asked the drones to do a search and, res search and rescue mission. One drone was assessing for a victim. He located the victim. The drone then, after that, after the visual confirmation, brought that information to another drone, which had the responsibility to come and assess the victim closer and gather more data. That drone, later on, brought the information to another drone, which served to mule the information to another humanitarian, another first responder, who had the responsibility to deploy and send rescue immediately. This is what we demonstrated at Drones for Good in Dubai a few weeks ago. And we truly believe that we have something that can change the way that humanitarians are working today. We truly believe that we have a technology that can reinvent the future of emergency response. We are building that technology day after day. But is building the future enough? We feel that there is more. What we need is to speed up the process and accelerate that diffusion of innovation. From an idea to a life-saving tool, what we need is to bring that tool to the hands of all humanitarians worldwide. Why? Because every day there is been more and more victims that are done, that are made by human-made disasters. And we know that every year there is an increase of the natural disasters happening worldwide. In fact, every year there is between 200 and 500 disasters and approximately 50 ongoing conflicts that are affecting between 300 million to 500 million of people worldwide. We need help when there is a disaster. In our case, we need some help to deliver this technology. In fact, we need your help. I need your help so that we can build the future together, the future of emergency response. And I leave you with this simple quote, words of wisdom. It always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you very much.